welcome to another episode of Direct to Consumer Academy. I'm your host, Micah Berto, and uh, today's episode is about um, simple inventory forecasting. So it's the beginning of 2019. If you haven't already started planning, you really need to. And uh, I think this is a pretty simple way for those who aren't necessarily using um, statistical focused inventory forecasting methods to get started. Um, so the background here is, is that uh, in my experience, I worked for uh, essentially Walmart, uh, worked for a contractor that sold uh, produce to them. And I was responsible for uh, actually forecasting and uh, sourcing and delivering produce to multiple distribution centers across the country. And using this model, uh, a little bit more of a complex model, but I, I, I simplified it for today and I'm going to actually link this template into the, the show notes. Um, but I was able to come up with forecasts using uh, data from past years. And of course, the more years you have in the past, the better the, the data in the future. But I mean, for what I have today, I have about a year and a half of past data. You can even do it with just a year. Um, I always suggest getting more and more if you can. Um, but with that being said, yeah, the, the focus for me was is I had to make sure that produce is delivered to these distribution centers just in time, meaning that you don't want your produce to be sitting in some distribution center before it hits the store, before it even gets into your shopping cart and into your refrigerator. So for me, I had to make sure that I forecasted that there was just enough so that it would almost run out before the next delivery so that that way the stores uh, and the, the distribution centers only held it for a matter of uh, a few days before it actually made it to the consumer's uh, refrigerator. So that said, um, let's kind of jump into the template with that background. I hope that giving you that background will help you understand how we can use this to, to forecast into the future. So that said, let's just look at this. Um, for those of you that are listening via audio, I'll do my best to try to explain the simple uh, ways that we're doing here, even though you won't be able to follow along with the formulas. Hopefully you'll be able to, to download it later. So if we look at uh, the spreadsheet I have here, we have purchase time as a column. The total price, uh, and purchase time is, is aggregated by month, I should note. Then the total price of everything sold during that month, the sum of the line items sold during that month, percentage change, um, which is highlighting the percentage change month to month. And then the average price is, is basically if you divided the total price divided by the, the sum of the items. So for the purpose of this, I left average price at 50 just to keep it very, very simple. Um, it's never going to be that simple unless you sell one of every single item on every single order. If you never sell two, then you know this template's right in line with you. It doesn't really matter, but just to note. So if we look at that, the first thing I'm going to show you here as a formula is this percentage change. So um, we're looking at purchase time here of July of 2017 compared to August of 2017. So if we look at the percentage change, we see 107%. And how did I come up with that? So um, if we look, uh, August was 802 units and uh, July was 388 units. So if I take 802 divided by 388 minus one, that will give me 107%, 107 change. Um, so if I was to add 107% to 388, I would get 802. So um, same thing on down for um, August of 2017, all the way through December of 2018. So you can see these changes uh, clearly, you know, November and December start to increase. You know, I'm just using this as an example of um, a seasonal item that has holiday sales. You know, it all depends on what you're selling. Uh, and then, you know, there's you could see in January 18, there was actually a dip from December of 2017, because, again, after you have all those holiday sales, people are probably not going to buy your items. So now that you understand this is just kind of the sample data, um, the only thing that's computed here is really the percentage change in the average price. Um, let me bring in the forecast that I have, which I have hidden for a second. So now if we look at what I came up with here, what I did for 2019 was is I took the percentage change from 2018. So again, January was 54% less than December. February was 2% less than January. March was actually 19% increase over February. So I took those numbers and I just copied that percentage change right down to 2018. So then I took our, um, our units in January of 18. Um, and I applied um, an increase to that um, by using a very simple formula here. So if we look at, um, let's see, right now we're, uh, we're, you know, we're looking at December of um, 2018 right here, comparing it to 19. So really, if we look at um, what I did here is we saw that in 2017, there was a, or I'm sorry, in January of 2018, we saw there was a 54% decrease from December of 2017. So in January of 19, I think it's safe to assume we'll probably see somewhere around a 54% decrease from December of 2018. So really, if you just 
take that and again apply this down the chain. Um, you know, February of 19 will be 2% less than January of 19 because February of 18 was 2% less than January of 18. So I just applied all of those numbers and now you can see if there was a total sum of units of 12,392 and sales of 619,000 in 2018, just by using those growth rates um, for 2019, um, you can see that now it looks like if we just remain everything uh, you know equal, we'll sell 15,626 units assuming the same growth rate with sales of 781,000. So this is a great baseline, but you need to really analyze why things happened in 2018. So for me, one thing that was really interesting to look at was if there was a big snowstorm right before Christmas, we might not see the same numbers that we saw the year before when it was actually nice in the Northeast. So, you know, that's just me giving you an, an example of what I used to look at. Um, maybe there was a hurricane in August of 2017 that affected the Southeast of the United States. And, you know, that's a big selling, selling region for us. Well, that's why we saw that decrease in August of 19. So you really need to go back and look at why you saw these percentage decreases and increases over 18. Um, and what I would suggest is, you know, what's your plan for 2019? Are you increasing marketing budget? If so, okay, maybe you should increase some of these numbers um, based on when you're going to deploy that marketing budget. So right now in April of 19, uh, we see a 27% decrease from March. I know that that was because in March of last year, we actually had a new product release. So that's why March was actually up 19% from February was because there's a new product release. Well, is March 19 really going to be that much bigger if we don't have a new product release? Probably not, right? So maybe I need to decrease that number, but then also ensure that, um, you know, April is not necessarily down 27%. The only reason it was down was because that new product increase was huge. So maybe I, I'll change that to 5%. And then looking back again, May of 19, why? Why is there a 36% increase from April? Oh, right. The product that I sell is swimwear. And, you know, May is the time when people are starting to think about summer and they start purchasing. Well, okay, maybe I should leave that as as 36% for this year. And maybe I should deploy my marketing budget right around May of 2019 or even April. So then if, if I do both of those things, it's like, okay, well, maybe I should increase to 45% um, to uh, of growth rate in 2019. And again, you just have to go through month by month and see where these things make sense and where they don't make sense. Um, for example, maybe you deployed a, a pretty decent marketing budget in November of 2018. You saw a 64% increase from October to November, but then you stopped that marketing budget right after Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Well, Christmas still had a 60% growth rate, but what if I kept that marketing going? Maybe Christmas could have saw a 95% growth rate. So now you can see we went through, we changed some of these percentage numbers really just based on feel. But now if I go back and I sum up um, the total for this year, you can see I'm almost at a million dollars versus that 700 some thousand that we initially had. So that's the, the simple way to do some inventory forecasting. Um, my one suggestion is, is I would always try to aim for the lean side. Um, and if you look at the way that uh, Google suggests setting OKRSs, and if you're not familiar, just go to Google and search Google OKRS. Um, it stands for objectives and key results. Uh, they suggest setting your goals at about 70% of what you think is it should be the, the real goal. Um, you don't want to stretch it too far, right? Because if people can hit 70% and they come shy, that's okay. But if you make the goal 100% and people fall short and they consistently fall short, they're never going to feel like they can beat their goal. So if you set it to 70%, you're always going to be happy if you get 80, 90, 100, 110, 120% of your goal. But you're going to be very disappointed if you set it to 100 and you end up hitting 70 so I would always try to do that same thing for me. And again, when I, in my past experience of doing this in the produce world, it was a little bit better to run short than it was run long. I mean, nobody wants old disgusting produce, you know, rather be that I can't buy my onions than see some disgusting ones. So um, that was the way that I would go um, about it was always trying to stay on the lean side. And I think that's true here, especially if you're looking at revenue numbers, um, you always want to make sure your revenue numbers are a little bit less than what you think is possible. Because in that way, if you hit that number, you're not going to be disappointed at the end of the year. You're not going to have uh, bad budgets. You're not going to run out of money. Um, on the other end, if you're looking at maybe um, number of units, maybe you want to forecast a little bit on the higher side because the worst thing you could ever do in, in a direct-to-consumer scenario is run out of inventory, right? So if a customer comes to buy from you and you run out of inventory and you have to cancel that order, there's nothing worse than that. And if you spend all the marketing dollars, the customer gets to your site thinking that they're going to find the exact item and they're ready to pull their credit card out of the pocket... That's great too, but what happens if it says out of stock? I mean, both of those are bad. So again, I think on the revenue, you want to aim low. And on the, the inventory side, you probably want to aim a little bit higher uh, when it comes to forecasting. So this is a, a very simple statistical model. Uh, I, I'd love to show something a little bit more in depth in a future episode. 
Uh, I've used specifically what I did in the past is I actually broke this down by week. This is just a simple overall monthly one. Uh, when you break things down by week, I think it actually does sometimes help you understand uh, different trends. And if you can get weekly data in your forecast from previous years, you're, you're already set up specifically if you run into a business that's seasonal, um, back to school, Christmas, um, you know, uh, spring, summer, uh, fashion, things like that change all the time. And specific weeks actually make a big difference. So that's been another episode of the Direct-to-Consumer Academy. Uh, I hope this is helpful. This uh, template that we've looked at in this video, or if you're on an audio podcast, will be linked on both d2cacademy.com and on our YouTube channel. Hope you find it helpful. Uh, add any comments. Be, be happy to help any of you that, that need help with this. And uh, here's to crushing your 2019 goals. Good luck. Good luck.